So the homework assignment for this week was to read chapters 14, 15, and 16. Uh, I've prepared slides for 14 and 15. I didn't think we'd get through 14 because it is a huge chapter. Um, it was a, it was a silly thought to think that we get through them all, but we'll see how it goes. One of the items that we were discussing was this item of the fig tree last week, right? So Jesus tells us in the end of Mark chapter 13 about what's going to happen in the future. What is life going to be like in uh, the years to come for our, maybe our grandchildren or our great grandkids? There, there's a generation that's going to experience um, everything that Christ has discussed. And for our generation, we've gotten to see how it's going to happen, right? So even though the coronavirus itself isn't, well, let's just say hypothetically, we, well, we know it's not the mark of the beast, this virus. It has given us an idea on how the culture will respond to a one world ruler, right? Right now, our nation and all nations have been looking to one group, which is the World Health Organization, for guidance on how to live their lives, right? Not to go outside, give up whatever freedoms you have. And we've seen the economy collapse. We've seen all these things happen. And it's a clear picture for us in society today to see what the future will hold when the true Antichrist shows his face. He is going to win the world over as a whole, the entire world. And it will probably be done through fear, kind of like what we've seen happen in these last couple of years. No, no, I no, no. He's going to be charismatic. He's not going to be ignorant. So here is the parable of the fig tree. It says, now learn this parable from the fig tree when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near, it is at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So Jesus has given us this particular parable of the fig tree right after he made the comment, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, right? There will be great pestilence. There will be, uh, you know, just the world's going to be in turmoil. That's going to happen. But that's not the end of days. Those things have to happen first, and they they act as like contractions. Where we see a woman, when she has her first contraction, it's painful, but it's not as painful as the contractions that are happening more rapidly towards the end of childbirth. So we've been given an analogy on how this thing's going to pan out. But everything that we read in the Bible seems to have some level of allegory or symbolism to the Old Testament or a foreshadowing of what the future is going to be. So multiple times we've read in the scriptures that the fig tree itself represents Israel. What's unique about this particular scripture is that we have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in Mark, in Luke, and I believe it's in Matthew. Those three Gospels, they record Jesus' explanation about what's going to happen, what's, what's ahead of us in the future. And we see a strong correlation to these items in the book of Revelation, which is where this group started two years ago. So we have to ask our, ourselves a question. Is Jesus referring to a specific time in history or is he referring to a, a season in the year, right? Because we see here in the scripture, it says when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So it could be a season. We could say, okay, we can perceive from the scripture that these things will begin to happen out of, right after the winter months or in between, right into spring, right? You could, you could gather that from this. Or Jesus is telling you, just as you would see a tree as it goes through its seasons, that's how you will see these things happening. It could be a foreshadowing that way. There is one other thought 
that we have very briefly touched on, and it is purely conjecture, but it was something that I, I withheld from the study last week because I didn't think that the topic itself would come up, and lo and behold, it did come up. So I'm going to read to you this conjecture, and it's something that uh, Miguel and I have talked about in the past. So let me, let me flip out of here, go to this page, and a new share. So another analogy for Israel, our, our anal analogy of Israel is this fig tree, right? So when would the fig tree be young and its branch be tender? We're looking at a nation that's been two, 3,000 years in the making, but in 70 AD, they ceased to exist. Rome wiped them off the face of the planet. They lost their homeland, they lost their temple, and they're scattered abroad, right? But fast forward to World War II, the Nazis basically try to eradicate all of the Jewish population, and from that, we see various treaties that take place, and Israel itself gets reestablished or reborn as a nation in 1948. So one could argue that this fig tree representation is that the fig tree is young. And they're saying that if, the, if Israel is the fig tree, the fig tree could never be young unless it was reborn. And so there are individuals who say this must be talking about how Israel is now occupying in its own land during this time from 1948 until whenever this ends. So here's an individual who shares his commentary about what a generation means, because in that parable of the fig tree, Jesus says this generation will by no means pass away before these things take place. So. The thought process is, if Israel was reestablished in 1948, and if you were born in Israel on 1948, you were the first generation that saw the budding of the new branch. So however long your lifespan is would equate to a generation, and those things must come to pass in your generation. It's a pretty bold thought, okay? So this individual here says that the 1948 generation is today, and there, this article was written in 2014, is 66 years old. And, and speaking in 2015, that they'll be 67 years old. So 2018, the generation who was born in Israel in 1948 will be 70 years old. This guy concludes from Psalm 9010 that a generation is able to go up to 80 years for labor and sorrow and then is soon cut off. But a typical generation is 70 years plus 10. 70 years are great. An extra 10 years are something that's given by God, but it doesn't seem to be the best, best years, so to speak. And so from this, this gentleman infers that since in 2018, the generation will be 70 plus 10 more years for the generation to be 80, 80 years, thus brings us to the year 2028, i.e. from 1948 to 2028 equals 80 years, and the generation is soon cut off as prophesied in Psalms. The cutoff will happen when Jesus Christ appears in the Armageddon battle, and this is his commentary. Therefore, since the generation will be over in the year 2028, and as Jesus said, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. That means that the latest for Jesus Christ to return is the year 2028. And we know that there's seven years of the Great Tribulation. That's true. We know that we have three and a half years of peace and three and a half years of turmoil. We know that's coming. 1260 days. It's, it's said all over the place. There is a specific seven-year period. It's known as Daniel's 70th week. And it's all throughout Scripture. And so this guy who shares this commentary, and he pulls this for many others as well, I feel is a little bit uh, a little bit too liberal when it comes to his dates and whatnot. But he suggests that the latest for the Great Chip Relation to begin is in the year 2021. Because if tribulation ends in 2028, thus 80 years following 1948, less seven years would be 2021. 
And so this is what his commentary has been. And he goes on to say all these various things. So I'm going to end this page here because, again, this is something that we wanted to talk about and kind of close the chapter on that. But for us, we believe in that terminology called sola scriptura, which means that we always refer to the Bible as our ultimate source for answers in our theology. And so if this would just pop up for me. This is something I want to share with you guys, because immediately after the fig tree parable, this is what Jesus says. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when that time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore. For you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping, and what I say to you, I say to you all, watch. So I get a little nervous when people start saying that Jesus Christ must do this before this date because it has to be on this date in order for this to be accurate. And Jesus says specifically in Mark 13, these are Jesus' words, they're in red, no man knows the day nor the hour, not even the angels in heaven. Okay. So, but Jesus does give us a strong command to watch. We need to be mindful of the things that are going around us. I think what we're doing here in our little group, having these discussions, especially about the coronavirus recently and seeing how a one world government could come in, looking at things like Bitcoin and these other currencies, we know there's going to be a one world currency in these end times. And you're going to have to show some type of a badge of servitude, whether a mark on your hand or on your forehead, in order to go to the grocery store and get milk for your kids. It's going to be that way. We can see how that may play out and we prepare our kids for it. It may even happen in our time. No man knows the day nor the hour, but we're still told to watch. So that ends chapter 14. I'm sorry, chapter 13. We're going to go ahead and start now in chapter 14. So verses one through two, after two days, it was the Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. So I ask you guys a simple question here is, do you remember what this feast is? Michelle. Yeah, what is the feast? It's on the screen. <laughs> the feast of unleavened bread. Okay. Do you guys remember the feast of unleavened bread? The first feast, yes. As when they came out of uh, Egypt, right? That is correct. Do you remember it, Mike and Shelly? Don't even know. Oh, she must have me muted. That's okay. I'm so sorry. I didn't want you to have the toys from the truck. That's all right. Do you remember the feast of unleavened bread? Okay, so the Feast of Unleavened Bread, just like Miguel said, and you guys can't see this on your screen, occurred in Exodus. And this was right after the Passover. These are all... What's that? Yes, I remember. Okay, so it's, it's referring to a passage in Exodus chapter 12. It says, now the blood shall be a sign for you in the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And it, there's a, a very long passage that goes on. That's because it's important. How many days did it take to, how many days? Did, okay, very good. I didn't even get to finish my statement. Very good, Michelle. Gold star. Gold star over here in the North House. Okay. And being at Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat on the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. She then broke the flask and poured it on his head. 
But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me, for you have done, for you have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish, you may do good, or you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. So, interestingly, in Mark's gospel, he records that this woman anointed Jesus's head with oil, and Jesus lets them know this is for his burial. It's happening, okay? In John's gospel, John chapter 12, it's a very similar type situation, but the woman is known as who? Miguel. Mary, the sister of Lazarus? Yes. It was Mary. I, I thought it was Mary. It's not Mary Magdalene, is it? It is Mary. No, Mary, the sister of, uh, I think it's Mary, the sister of Lazarus, because it was Mary right. and Martha. That's right. Mary and Martha, you're correct. So if you notice in John's account, it says to let her alone. She's doing this for my, for my burial, but she breaks a costly thing of oil and anoints his feet and washes her feet with, his, with her hair. And so we see kind right. of maybe like what, I wouldn't call it a contradiction, but we see a parallel in which two different records are um, being brought out here. And so it was very interesting for me to see that there was multiple anointings of Christ. There was at least three anointings that took place. And we see these women anointing him at various times. It could very well be Mary anointing Jesus's head and his feet. And John records it uh, as such for her hair, because remember, we saw that each one of the gospels presents Christ in a different light. But I think there's a little bit deeper meaning to that. I'll talk about that in a second. But this website here, Answers in Genesis, goes into great detail about how um, there was multiple accounts in which Jesus would have been anointed specifically for his burial. This one being the, the, lat the latest anointing as it was just two days before his death. And each one of them kind of records time a little bit differently. We also know that the individual who was indignant, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this as a pop question to... Uncle Charlie, Uncle Charlie, which disciple do you think was upset about money and thinking that this this is wedding that dowry? Who? Yeah, that is correct. It is Judas. Judas was the one who was in charge of the money. And, and the scripture tells us about that. But one thing that I want to point out before we move on about this anointing is the anointing of the head. Where else do we remember someone being anointed in their head in something that we read recently. Do you remember, Miguel? Back then it was Aaron. Please. Yes. Yes. So in the book of Exodus, Moses was told to anoint the high priest, which was Aaron at that time. And he anointed his head with his, you know, whatever his um, holy garments were. It was a, an oil that dripped onto his turban. And we see in Exodus 29, verse 5, it says, um, Then you shall take the garments and put the tunic on Aaron and the robe of the ephod to the ephod and the breastplate and gird him in, in with intricately woven to the ephod and put a turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban and you shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put tunics on him. I just thought it was interesting because, again, what we've learned is that everything's in there for a specific reason. And so something seems a little out of place. It's what they, the Jews call a remez. It's a hint at something more. So in this instance, you could easily draw the, the um, conclusion from the symbolism that Christ is being anointed before his burial. And that's even what he said, that she's doing this for me before my burial. And um, we'll go ahead and move on to that. Move on from there. So Mark chapter 14, verse 10, then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priests to betray him to them. And when they heard it, 
they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you there carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him wherever he goes in, wherever he goes in, say to the matter of the, I'm sorry, say that's really small on my screen. Say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared there make ready for us. So his disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he had said to them. And they prepared the Passover. In the evening, he came with the 12. Now as he sat and ate, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. Then they began to be sorrowful and to say to him one by one, it is I, or is it I? And another said, is it I? And he answered and said to them, it is one of the 12 who dips with me in the dish. The son of man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better or it would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Um, again, this is an instance. Lillian, please go in there. It's not going to happen, sweetheart. Come back down. Sit down. You can't go back and forth. Okay. So this is another one of those instances where we see Jesus is in clear control of what's going to happen in the upcoming days. He had a full awareness of what was coming his way as well. He knew he was going to die. We've talked about that multiple times. He's revealed to them multiple times that he's going to die and be risen in the third day, but they didn't understand what that part meant. Um, let's go on to the next slide. I don't know if I can do that with this zoomed in like that. Okay. Uh, now they're inside that chamber right now where they're all enjoying the Passover meal and they're dipping their bread into the, the sop. He's revealed that it's Judas. The other gospels share with us that it was Judas who dipped with him. And they call him out plainly in, in Mark's account here. Uh, he just records what Jesus said. So, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, take, eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So one of the things that I did on this particular passage is I close my eyes and imagine if I was sitting at the table and I was passing out bread in the manner that Jesus was doing it. And think about a piece of bread being torn and passed around the table individually, one to each person, right? How would that symbolize his body? And because we've read the other gospels, we know that Christ's flesh was ripped from his body when he was beaten severely with those various whips that had, you know, the, like a cat of nine tails, they had those various pieces of glass and bone and shards that when they hit people it would stick in the skin and they would rip and it would literally almost deglove his back and his sides. So this symbolism that he's sharing with him, he already knows what's going to happen. And he's breaking that bread and saying, this is my bread. This is my body being broken for you. And then we see we're also talking about a time in history where they're celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread for the Passover. Jesus is saying in this scripture right here, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. He's referring to the remission of sins. His blood is acting just like we've talked about multiple times as the blood of the Passover lamb. Remember what John said about Jesus? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away what? Someone tell me. Takes away what? 
the sin of the world. The sin of the world. John the Baptist, the last Old Testament prophet, calls it out plainly for all of us to see. That's what Jesus was. He was the Passover lamb for anyone, anybody who would be willing to receive him. It's as simple as that. So when we talk about the Last Supper and we talk about communion, when Jesus says, do this often in remembrance of me, when we're taking communion and we look at that bread as it's broken, we need to remember that our forgiveness was paid for with a price. And it was his body and his blood that covers our sins and gives us the freedom to be with him in heaven uh, for all those who believe in him. Um, I'm not going to get into the slide unless we want to talk about that further. Mark chapter 14, verse 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke more vehemently. If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said, likewise. So that's something that I've missed before. I've always thought of it just being Peter being the one who stands up. I don't care if all these men are going to deny you, Lord. I will never be that one who turns his back on you. But it's clear here in Mark's gospel, it was all of them that were making that bold proclamation. And they all fled. They all fled. And what is that a fulfillment of? John, we, uh, that the shepherd will Yep. He was going to strike the shepherd. Exactly. And the flood's going to disperse something like that. Exactly. So you exactly, Miguel. Is we see that anything that's in bold like that in all caps means that it is something from the Old Testament, which means it was prophesied that it was going to happen. Jesus tells them right here. This is what's so unique about our creator, guys. This is one of those things where if you want to know how you know your Bible is accurate and you have a fingerprint of God. You look at something like this. This is something that was 700 years before Christ came to earth. It's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Jesus is telling them that this scripture is about them right now in that time period. And then he tells them, you guys are these people and this is what you're going to do to me. And they're telling him, no way. That's not what we're going to do. They even know the game plan before it happens. He tells them what's going to happen. He tells them what they're going to do and they deny it. Let's see what they do. Then they came to the place, which was, was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him. And he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So they left the Mount of Olives. They're in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is crying out to God. He's asking, uh, you know, his inner circle to pray with him. And he's asking if there's any other way for man to have salvation, let it be so, God. But he, 
adds a very important line item. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. If you guys ever ask the question, is there any other way for us to get into heaven besides what Christ already completed for us? Can I, can I do a multitude of good works? Can I be like uh, Mother Teresa? Can I, can I be like these individuals who, who's, who's all these good works have outweighed the bad? The answer is no. This is what was required for the sin that you and I got, you, all of us in this world have committed. Um, we see in some of the other gospels that Jesus was so trembling at this time that he was sweating drops of blood during this prayer. It was very, uh, it was a moment of distress. Not that he was unwilling, but wanting there to be another way. And there wasn't. So immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, with a great multitude, with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer had given them a signal, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. As soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of those who stood by drew a sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus answered and said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then they all forsook him and fled. Okay, bonus points. Who was the man who cut off the high priest's servant's ear? Peter. That's correct. It was Peter. How do you know that? Because he was with Jesus when Judas got there. That's right. Well, the reason we know it is because it's recorded in the other gospel, right? Yes. And, and what do we know about Peter? Is he got a pretty bad aim because he got his ear. <laughs> he must have been swinging for the fences. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, and Jesus healed that man, if you guys recall. Yeah, but. Yeah. Interesting, very interesting note. The very last sentence in this verse selection is then they all forsook him and fled. They all took off. Then this little weird recording, verses 51 through 52, which doesn't appear in any of the other gospels. Now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young man laid, and the young men laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled away, fled away from them naked. <laughs> it's kind of a weird, weird thing that Mark includes here, and um, this is one of those instances where there are a select few of scholars who are saying, "This has got to be Mark. This is Mark's recollection of an account where he was one that was there." And he's recording about how he fled. He was wearing just a linen cloth and they grabbed him and he ran because when they grabbed his linen cloth, that's all that he had on him and he ran away naked. There are other scholars that say, okay, this is an instance of, you know, a covering over the sin of the naked body. And then when Jesus is resurrected, his clothes are left behind, his, the, the linen cloth is left there. Again, it's a very interesting verse that doesn't appear in any of the other gospels. There may, there may be some deeper meaning to it. We're not going to get into it tonight, but just thought I'd throw that out there. Moving on, verses 53 through 65. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witnesses against him, but their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? 
What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, prophesy. And the officer struck him with the palms of their hands. Now, as Peter was below in the cart courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. And he went out on the porch and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began to say to those who stood by, this is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by, by said to Peter again, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. A second time, the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. Immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered and said to them, It is as you say. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you? But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at the feast, he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call king of the Jews? So they cried again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them. And he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium. And they called together the whole garrison. And they clothed him with purple. And they twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spit on him. And bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off of him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by, to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place Golgotha which is translated place of the skull. And they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was, a th now it was the third hour and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, the king of the Jews. With him, they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. 
So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking among themselves with the scribes said, He has saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And in the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, look, he is calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge filled with sour wine, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn into from top to bottom. So when the centurion, who was opposite of him, saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less and Joseph and Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. What's the significance of Jesus dying on the cross at that moment and the temple veil tearing in two? Miguel. That from that moment, uh, we can, we have access to talk with God. That's right. There's a picture here on the screen. Um, and to me, it just accurately represents, again, we don't know what these people looked like, but this imagery to me really speaks volumes when you consider his mother, his close friends, having his body taken off the cross and preparing to embalm him. Now, when everything had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in linen and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph observed where he was laid. Chapter 16, verse one. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might come and anoint him very early in the morning. On the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen, and they said amongst themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door for the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, 
he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went out and told those who had been with him, as they mourned and wept. And when he, and when they heard that he was alive and he had been seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two other, to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, he appeared to the 11 as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. And that is the end of Mark. I can't believe we got all the way through chapter 16. Um, we have completed the book. And that gets us into next week's study, which is going to be what is the will of the Father? That's our homework. Um, it does... We have eight minutes. We've never finished early like this before. Is there anything that you guys had questions on with the content? Nothing for me. Okay. Okay. Well, um, we've finished another book out of the Bible. Um, I wish I would have done a little bit more on Mark chapter 16. I honestly thought we would never get to it because Mark chapter uh, um, 14 was so large. It was huge. It was like 72, 72 verses. So again, our goal is going to be to discuss next week what the will of the Father is. And we're going to have a final on the book of Mark. We're going to test our knowledge and our skill of retention. And we've, we've been over this book for the last six weeks. Next week, our seventh week will be a review and we will be discussing what the will of the Father is. I would ask that everyone kind of glean their Bibles through all scriptures, not just the book of Mark, but what, they, uh, what conclusion they come to, what the will of the Father is. And it's something that I've been looking at in, in pretty good detail along with studying Mark. So I have quite a bit of material to present to you guys as far as scripture is concerned on um, how we should be living our life as well as what is God's plan for our lives. So if no one has any questions on the reading, I can go ahead and just shut us down on prayer.